The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. You're back in the House of Mystery, and today we have a special show. It's when we put one of our own on the front seat. He's in the chair for torture. And, of course, I'm Al Warren doing some of the torture, and joining me is Mike Brown doing the rest of it. Hello. <laughs> that was hard. And in the chair, our own Dr. Joseph Yusinski. Now, because what he's doing is he has a new book coming out. It's available for pre-order now. It officially releases on January 15th. Conspiracy Theories, a primer. So, Joe, welcome. Well, thank you for having me, Al. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, somebody's got to do it. No, I'm trying to pretend that we haven't been recording episodes all week. There yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Pretend that. So, Mister Mister Yasinski, tell me about this book. Now, 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 you've written book, books before, and your books before on conspiracy have been kind of. Um, I want to say controversial to an extent, um, you know, even in the titles. Um, so why, why, why write another book, and this book in particular? Uh, yeah, so you're right. Everything I, I write does get people upset, and I get a lot of angry phone calls and really wackadoo emails and the occasional death threat. Um, but I don't think it's people actually reading anything I write. They'll read the headline and they'll get incensed, and they'll they'll want to take some sort of action on it. Um, I, when most people tend to read what I have to say, they don't get that upset. And usually, if they start out upset, they wind up not being that way. Um, so why do I do it? I I mean, it could be glutton for punishment. Um. <laughs> But I, I've been doing this for 10 years, uh, you know, researching conspiracy theories and why people believe them, and I think I'm sort of stuck with it now. So I could I could do a change of career, but um, I, I, I think this is just the easy, easiest way to spend the rest of my life. So what got you into studying conspiracy theories in the first place? What What was the first one to catch your interest? So when I was really young, I was really big into the Oliver Stone JFK movie. And I think a lot of people who, you know, a lot of Gen Xers who saw that movie, it, it captured, you know, captured our attention. I was like, oh, my God, everyone's in on it, and we're living in a world where um, everyone's part of a shadowy conspiracy and nothing is what it seems. And um, so it's sort of a, a, a neat idea. And for me, it was rather titillating, but I never thought of it as a topic for research or anything to be explored. Or even a career yeah, certainly not. I mean, when I got my PhD, it was just studying media and how it affected people, um, people's opinions. It was late after I got my job here at, at University of Miami that one of my colleagues came to me and said, hey, let's do this conspiracy thing. And I was like, that sounds stupid. <laughs> um, because 10 years ago, this wasn't anything anyone cared about. It was like, oh, yeah, there's a bunch of idiots who believe some dumb stuff, and so what? It's not consequential to politics in any way. Um, so it took some some talking for me to get into it, um, but we did. And then, wow, did things change over the last few years where when we came out with the first book, American Conspiracy Theories, I mean, that was 2014, and that was pre-Trump. So mm. conspiracy theories were sort of becoming more political at that time but once trump got in into the presidential race i mean things just really changed and and then it's just been non-stop from there um, well i uh, so now I, I was gonna say when you get into these conspiracy theories how do you choose which ones you're gonna write about so that's a pretty good question. I mean, there one thing that people have to understand about conspiracy theories is that, you know, when we hear the term conspiracy theory, a few come to our mind, right? Like fake moon landing, birther, truther, JFK. 
Um, but there's an infinite number out there, and there are new conspiracy theories popping up all the time. Um, if you go to Twitter at 3 a.m., you'll find all sorts of conspiracy theories that pop up, and then by the next day, they're, they're largely gone. Um, it's, it's very few that, that become popular or will have books or TV shows made about them. Um, so with so many out there, I mean, choosing what particular ones to write about is sort of difficult. And that's why I, I try to avoid focusing on specific ones. To me, it's more about the mindset that people have that gets them to accept conspiracy theories writ large rather than anything about the conspiracy theory itself. Um, I mean, it's certainly more fun to talk about, you know, the pe the peculiarities of, you know, the JFK assassination and why the CIA might have done it or why Castro might have done it. Um, so, but once, once you put that stuff aside, what you find is that people are just getting into this because of things that go on in their own head and not so much the evidence. So it's like people are trying to confirm their own narrative with uh, a belief in a conspiracy theory. Next time you, yeah, I mean, that's exactly what it is. Next time you have a big family get together, whether it's Thanksgiving or something like that, look around the table and you will see that there are some people there whose mentality just lends itself to believing in almost <laughs> any conspiracy theory that, that they'll come across. And there'll be other people who sort of reject every conspiracy theory that they come across. I mean, that has nothing to do with the specifics of the conspiracy theories in question. It has to do with how they view the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people, they look outside and they just see shadowy conspiracies controlling everything. Um, and some people don't have that as much. Um, and that's, that's really what drives um, people to adopt these things. It's not so much what they hear. It's not Facebook. It's not the Internet. It's not some piece of evidence that changed their mind. It's just their willingness to accept such ideas. That's what does it. So now, what do you think the biggest misconceptions of conspiracy theories are? So the funniest one that I found in the last decade was that when, you know, when we were going back in time and looking at newspaper articles that had been written by journalists about the topic, so many of them had said, now is the time of conspiracy theory. Now is the time where everyone has lost their mind and become a conspiracy theorist. And you can find it now, two years ago, five years ago, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Journalists have always been saying the same thing. I mean, there's always a conspiracy theory panic. Everyone's always lost their mind. Um, but when we look at the data, we don't find any evidence that, that this is really the case. I mean, we could say now is sort of an interesting time for conspiracy theories in the sense that we have a president who's using them quite a bit. <laughs> but in terms of people's opinions or their levels of belief in these theories, there's, there isn't strong evidence that we are now a bunch of conspiracy theorists, um, but that, but weren't just a few years ago. I mean, that's just viewing the past with rosy hindsight. It could also be that they have a lot more access. They're public. People can tweet and uh, Facebook and all that sort of stuff. So they become parts of groups, and um, it gets much more publicized. Yeah, you can see it, right? So in the old days, you can't see me talking to my coworkers at the at the water cooler, but now you know because we're talking in text to people in public forums, you can see what people are saying, and you can sort of catalog it. Um, but again, it's just like any epidemic where you start measuring it better and you're going to find more of it. And people say, oh my God, we have a market rise in this. And no, we don't have a rise in it. It's just that people are paying attention and we're, we actually have a way to measure it now. It doesn't mean it wasn't going on before. Yeah. And, and we can look at prominent example. I mean, go back. I mean, JFK started or JFK conspiracy theorists started right after the assassinations and shot up to almost 80% of the country believed in JFK conspiracy theories for decades. No Internet needed. You know, no no Trump needed either. And that, that stuff was there for, for decades and decades, and it's still a majority belief. Um, so there's always been people who will buy into to these ideas. They're always there. It's it's more of a constant than it is anything else. Do you feel like uh, some of these are harmful to people? 
Yeah. I mean, most certainly. I mean, if you look at the news now, you find QAnon people who are uh, committing violence based on their beliefs. You know, if, I mean, if you believe that the country is secretly run by satanic deep state pedophiles who are running a sex trafficking ring mm-hmm. um, and causing all sorts of human misery, then you may want to fight fire with fire. Yeah. You know, we've, we've had multiple incidents of this. And you, you could look at other things, too, like like uh, health health conspiracy theories. I mean, there are people every year who die from diseases that are easily either preventable or curable um, because they think that, you know, the, the medical community is hiding, um, you know, the true cure um, or they're hiding the dangers of an actual cure, like vaccines. You know, when, when my wife was diagnosed with cancer, she went on to Google... <laughs> You know, after she got back oh. from the doctor, oh, and started no. saying, well, you know, what do I do about cancer? The, some of the top things that came up were, you know, eat a lot of turmeric and tape onion slices to your feet. <laughs> and <laughs> oh, and I no. said, first of all, even if it works, I'm not letting you do it because you're going to stink up the house. And I said, second of all, um, that doesn't work, and we, we're going to do normal doctor stuff. And... You know, she did the normal doctor stuff, the chemo and the radiation, and now she's cancer-free. Yeah. Um, but there are people who choose the turmeric and the onions, and they die. Right. Um, just the same. We've had the, the, the reemergence of diseases, um, like measles, that are easily preventable, but people are now dying um, because you have a bunch of people who think they know better than the doctors. Well, I do know better. <laughs> <laughs> quack quack <laughs> i do i do um well so so they're becoming they can be dangerous but they're not always how how, how do you draw a line between the two like I, you're I, how do i say this you're open for public forum and public speech and you want any anybody to be able to say anything but what is that we should do about these um Outrageous nutball conspiracies. Yeah, so that's a tougher question because I, I, if people ask me, well, how do you differentiate the sort of the good ones from the nutball ones? And I just say, you know, there really isn't a clear way to differentiate that. Um, I mean, clearly, beliefs can lead to actions, but they don't always. So if every person who believed a conspiracy theory were to take violent action on it, then the streets would run red with blood and everyone would be dead um, because everyone believes at least one, if not a few. So, yes, there are instances that conspiracy beliefs can lead to a bad outcome, um, but that's not most of the time. And in this country... Um, you know, politically motivated violence, which is where conspiracy violence would be, is, is, is generally rare, even though instances of it do catch our attention um, in the media. So, you know, this, this is a perennial question and one that Congress is trying to deal with and one that the social media companies are trying to deal with. And uh, I, I think the answer is there really isn't anything good that could be done um, that wouldn't already or, or, or that wouldn't infringe seriously on free speech rights. I mean, just imagine well, what's going to go on in a conspiracy theorist's head once you start censoring them. No. You know, what are they going to say? You know, it only proves my ideas are true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's not going to change anyone's belief if we start censoring or, you know, uh, targeting conspiracy theorists in some way. So it's an election year right now. Yeah. Um, are you noticing anything uh, more prevalent than anything else? Some real prevalent conspiracy theory popping up to to prop up the current president or to maybe even uh, knock him down? Well, clearly, I mean, you have you've had for the last two and a half years this idea that Trump is somehow a pawn of Putin um, that was largely decimated by the Mueller. Uh, report that showed that Trump was was not coordinating with the Russians and was not some sort of pawn of Vladimir Putin. Um, now that the Democrats sort of moved on from that, they're now onto the impeachment, 
which seems to be much more grounded in in actual um, abuses of power. Um, but Trump has defended himself against both by saying there's a witch hunt out to get uh, out to get him, and this is all just Democrats conspiring against him. So that's gonna that's gonna continue through the election and even after, regardless of what the outcome is. Um, but the, the bigger problem I see, besides the conspiracy theories, is the fear of conspiracy theories, where right now you have Congress and mainstream media outlets like the Washington Post and New York Times putting pressure on social media companies to limit uh, free speech, particularly speech by politicians. Mm-hmm. Like today, the New York Times is saying, you know, we want uh, Facebook to decide if politicians' ads are true or not, and then to uh, somehow, I guess, censor the ones that they decide aren't true. I mean, it's incredibly Orwellian. I mean, just first of all, like, a bunch of Congress people are like, you know, we lie too much, so we're going to blame Facebook for it and make them come up with some <laughs> algorithm that can stop us. No, how about, how about Congress start holding themselves accountable, and if a member of their body lies... They boot them. Why don't they do that? You know, why Why would Congress call, um, you know, the C- Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, in front of it to talk about lying and say how important it is they get lies off of Facebook, but, you know, at the same time, Congress has carte blanche to say anything it wants on the floor. And that's enshrined in the Constitution, and the reason is because they know that in politics you need free and completely open debate. You know, but somehow, Facebook is just too important to have such a thing. <laughs> you know, so if you're, if you're doing a markup on a bill, you can say anything you want, but if you're hanging out at 2 a.m. on Facebook, no, we have to censor you. <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, personally, I think the problem with Facebook or, or uh, any of the social media is there's too many um, groups that represent themselves as a media or a, uh, some sort of a news place, you know, like like Alex Jones did for years, where they were Infowars news, you know, and uh, Breitbart and stuff, and so they could publish anything, and they're they're not getting sued or t- they're not held at the same standard as someone like the Washington Post. Um, well, it's her, who who knows? I mean, it's. Um, the mainstream places make mistakes too. They oh, have they their do. own blind spots. Yeah, they have their own blind spots, and and sometimes they have egregious errors that they won't always retract or fix. Right. Um, I'm not trying to say that Breitbart's on the same level as the you know Washington Post, the New York Times, um, but the distinctions aren't always quite that easy. Um. Part of the problem is that people view politics as a game, like sports, or as a soap opera, you know, like like celebrity gossip, or something like that. So just like in those domains, you've had a lot of you know shoddy news reporting. You know, when you walk through the grocery aisle and you get the Inquirer or something like that to hear about the royal family or this actor or that actor, and nothing's really, <laughs> you know, you don't put that much stock in it. Um, you get the same thing in politics, where you know you get the nonsense that says Hillary Clinton's dead, and we could tell because she has the wrong size pantsuit, <laughs> um, and things like that. So you, you mean you, Bat Boy's not real? Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> so this has been going on for years. It's just now done in the domain of politics because people view it the same way they view these other domains. Or at least some people do. Yeah. Um, but but as dangerous as it sounds. And there could be instances where it would cause serious problems. I mean, you, its effect is vastly overestimated. And part of the reason for that is when the Democrats lost in 2016, they had to find a boogeyman. They couldn't simply say, you know, we screwed up. Or Donald Trump beat us because people mm-hmm. like his message. Instead, they, they buried their heads in the sand and said, oh, it was some crazy conspiracy with Russia, and it was the fake Russian news that, that did this. And no, there just isn't strong evidence that that was the case. I mean, you largely know how people are going to vote months in advance, um, if not decades in advance, of an election. 
um, so to say that some freaking Facebook ad changed how somebody was going to vote um, is, is, is absolutely ridiculous. When, you know, you look at the amount of money that was spent on these Facebook ads, it's, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the, the billions that was spent in the election. Oh, but as soon as I heard Hillary was eating uh, baby pizzas, <laughs> I mean, uh, that I couldn't vote for her eating baby pizzas. That sounds you know, good. You know, in the, see, the thing with this is it sounds wacky, but I get accused of the same thing. Yeah. I mean, somebody somebody found a picture of me wearing red socks, and they said, well, this shows he's one of the satanic pedophiles because, you know, they said that the red shoes and red socks are made of the baby's skin after the after we after we cook the babies and then we wear oh, the I, red I shoes thought it was and socks. Communism. I thought you were a commie for. Uh, oh, probably that too. Probably that too. Well, um, you... <laughs> Only commies eat dead babies. Yeah, yeah. So, but you, you, you know, the funny thing is, you can look at these beliefs and you can find where they come from different places, right? So. You'll have the people who are concerned about the sex trafficking, and then you'll have people who are concerned about Satanists and people who are concerned about um, deep state things. Um, but that's the thing with conspiracy theories, is that you can choose your own adventure. Mm. There's not, like, one official version of any theory. You can just make up whatever you want and, ro and roll with it. And if you follow Twitter closely enough, you'll see that that's entirely the case. People can come up with their own fan fiction about anything and, and that's their that's their new reality i did kind of an experiment this year for christmas um with some of my listeners well all of my listeners i did uh, die hard as though it were a real true crime thing that happened and we played it completely straight up and told the story of the incident at nakatomi plaza and the reactions of people has been really fascinating <laughs> some people really believe that this thing had happened just because we told them it did yeah i mean you can go back through history and find examples where where this happens um i think so, sometimes um we overblow people's um willingness to believe things like here like if you go back to the uh um Back in the 30s, when they were talking War about the yeah, talking about an alien invasion or something yeah. like that, and when I was taught this in high school, they say, "Oh, everyone, you know, escaped because they thought the aliens were coming." It was a small, small number of people once yeah. they went back and looked at it. Or the example where Johnny Carson said, I think in the 70s, that you know there was uh, a shortage of toilet paper. So some people did go out and start stocking up on toilet paper. Um, <laughs> But it's, sometimes these messages don't have the power that we ascribe to them because people don't listen as well as you know we assume. And they're lazy. <laughs> well, I could do without toilet paper. I could do without months. toilet paper. I just yeah, <laughs> I got some newspaper. So, so what do you think the role of the internet is? Um, what 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 role does it play with conspiracy theorizing and and um, and how does how much does it have an effect on it? So uh, people think that the Internet is like the biggest driver of conspiracy theories. Um, but I don't think that it has deserved that reputation at all. And the reason for that is, I mean, we could just look at, at the data. I mean, conspiracy beliefs were alive and well before the Internet showed up. Um, and I already mentioned JFK. I mean, we had 80% almost of Americans believing in JFK conspiracy theories in the 60s and 70s. No Internet needed at all. Um, we had red scares without an Internet. We've had anti-Semitism. You know, if you go back a couple hundred years, you had witch hunts. No Internet needed for any of these things. So you could, if you took away the Internet right now, it's not as if conspiracy theories are going to go away. They will probably increase, <laughs> if anything. <laughs> and I think what people forget about the internet is they 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 say, "Oh my God, the internet! It's got all conspiracy stuff." As if as if like every page you go to is just chock full of conspiracy theories. It just isn't. I mean, if you look at where web traffic is on the internet, it's not a conspiracy websites, and conspiracy websites aren't even in the top couple of hundred places that people go to. I mean, people are going to, 
you know, watch movies, uh, to masturbate, Porn. to book travel, to find dates. And they're doing all those things long before they go to find conspiracy theories. And that's very clear in the, in the web traffic data. So uh, if there's some idea that somehow the Internet showed up and everyone just became a, a conspiracy troll, it's just not true. And, and the other part of that is the Internet has given us better information, access to better information than we ever have had in the past. So, like, when I was a kid and I would get a sunburn, my grandmother would rub butter on me, <laughs> right? If you Google that, you know, sunburn, the first thing will come and says, don't rub butter on people. <laughs> <laughs> now you can get direct access to real medical advice from real doctors. You can hear real um, expertise from people in any in any domain, um, you don't have to rely on village wisdom anymore. You don't have to make stuff up um, the way that we've done in the past. So the Internet has probably done far more to push back against conspiracy theories than, than, than any other thing. And I, and, and I think it's just, it's just this thing where every new communication technology gets blamed for, for whatever human problem we seem to care about at that moment. You know, if you go back in time, uh, you know, radio gets blamed, TV gets blamed, newspapers were blamed. I mean, when we they invented the printing press, people were freaking out, like, oh, my God, we can't let have people have access to this. The they Bible, might believe yeah. the wrong things. And we've seemed to do just fine with each of these. Well, except for that pizza store. <laughs> yeah, except for the pizza store. <laughs> so um, now... What about groups that, that form um, people like QAnon, QAnon um, you say it back there, but uh, a group like that is, is fairly substantial, and uh, they spread a lot of theories that are, I think, pretty wacky, but they still con insist and contain quite a few followers. Yeah, so it's tough to know with QAnon, and, and uh, it, it, they're sort of an exception to to the rule in many ways and that you know if you have a conspiracy theory that explains an event or circumstance it's sort of an idea it's out there and people can believe it or not with QAnon it's an ongoing thing that people can take part in so it's ongoing so you have this person called Q who posts what are called breadcrumbs or little um, coded clues on these underground you know, anonymous chat boards, and people follow them, and they try to decode them, and then they come up with their own stories about them, and they've created their own little community and YouTube channels, and they have their own swag, you know, <laughs> coffee mugs and hats, <laughs> and, you know, so if you ever see anyone wearing Q and the hashtag, you know, where we go one, we go all, WWG1WGA, um, I mean, they see themselves as part of a community. Now, how big that community is, is, is tough to know. Um, so we pulled on this in a few ways. Um, the best I could tell um, we, is about 10% of the country, uh, when we last polled on it, um, thought the QAnon, they viewed it somewhat favorably. So we gave people a feeling thermometer. So from zero to a hundred, if, if they ranked it a hundred, they really liked it. If they rated it zero, they really hated it. Um, only about ten percent of the country put it above a fifty, which, for a conspiracy theory or any political object, is really, really low. Um, I've said this before on Fox News, and all the Q people were going crazy on Twitter, like, "Oh my God, that's thirty million people! We're taking over the world!" And and I said, "Well." You know, it's, it's, you know, when we, when we also polled about Fidel Castro, Castro comes in about, about as popular as QAnon. Um, and Castro is not very popular. So that's about where they're at. Um, but it's, it's ongoing and it, it has fascinated, you know, a certain number of people, but how many people I just don't know. Like when, when I get harassed by the Q people online, on, on Twitter, for example, I mean, none of these people have real pictures or real names, 
and their profiles all look sort of phony. So I don't know who are these real people? Or are these Russian bots? Are they, you know, people trying to josh with us or something? And I I just don't know. It's like if I have any other conversation on Twitter, I'll have real people with real pictures that I can sort of tell are real engaging with me. But um, Q is one of those things where I don't know what's real and what's fake. And and I think um, sometimes it looks like they're trending on Twitter or they have some big presence, but it, it's it's hard to know. So so what 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 are you what are you hoping people <laughs> people that's all folks what are you hoping people get out of the book what are the most interesting points that um, that you um, want people to pick pick up and get out of the book yeah so when I wrote the book it was it was largely because I teach a class on conspiracy theories and there was no real textbook for it um, but as I was writing it I didn't want to write it just for students and keep it very you know, have a dry book. I, I wrote it that so that it would be accessible to anybody, anywhere, and it sort of just even-handedly lies out all the major concepts that that one would care about if you were thinking about conspiracy theories and and why people believe them. Um, the big idea to take away from it is that we got to be very careful with our beliefs. It's it's very easy to believe things um, that comport with our pre-existing worldviews. Um, it's much tougher to withhold belief until we, we see real evidence or until the experts have weighed in and sort of told us what's true and, and, and what's not. And I think that's that's sort of the important thing, is that it's important to think for yourself. Um, but part of thinking for yourself is knowing your own limitations knowing where we should be relying on others, on experts, and knowing you, you know, um, when we should be withholding belief until such a time as the evidence has really been, been looked at by the people who know how to examine it. So, you know, if you think about why do people believe what they believe, um, people are often coming to, to their beliefs just in really weird ways. Oh, I found this on Twitter. Oh, my uncle said it. Or, oh, I just made this up last night and it makes sense to me. Or, oh, I found it on some strange web page somewhere. Um, those aren't great ways to find truth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so if we want to ask questions like, is the earth warming? Or um, are vaccines safe? Or do vaccines work? You know, um, how do we cure cancer? I mean, these are things where where we have to understand that the average person doesn't have any expertise in this whatsoever. And many of the people that we look to for expertise maybe don't have it. If you're listening to actors at the Golden Globes tell you what's true and what's not, you're listening to the wrong people. If you're listening to politicians in your preferred party tell you what's true and what's not, you're probably listening to the wrong people. I mean, there are real experts out there who study these things, and they gather data, and they they have real methodologies to find out you know what's fact and what's fantasy. And that's where we should be relying on. Um, and not just, you know, our favorite talking head or our favorite goofy web page out there. <laughs> yeah. But no one's, but no one's going to listen to me, so no, <laughs> what are you going to so, do? <laughs> well, people it, are going to believe what they want to believe, yeah, right? Yeah, people believe what they want to believe. But, but at least, even if people want to continue doing that, at least I want to put the message out there that's, that's not the best way to do it. There are other ways to go about it. And, and if you have a belief, at least put error bars around your belief and say, hey, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, and, and there's a difference between, between belief and uh, evidence, right, and, and, and research. And, you know, when you ask someone, like, why do you believe this? A lot of times what they'll tell me is, well, because it's true. Because <laughs> if, like, you know... It's, it's like Moses coming down with the commandments. They were written on Mount Sinai, and they just get implanted into our brain somehow. It's like, no. I mean, there's a reason why people believe things. Um, and truth has nothing to do with it. Right? So, you know, people will believe things that are exactly the opposite, and you ask them why they believe them, they'll say, well, because it's true. Well, both people can't be right. Well, thank goodness the earth is flat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, crazy stuff. Crazy. But then, crazy. When he, but then here's the thing: it's like, well, why do you think it's flat? Well, because that's what you know. That's because it's true. And then you get the hollow earth person, 
Who uh. says, no, it's round, but hollow, and there's, you know, little hobbits living inside. <laughs> I well, wish. now what do you do? <laughs> that would be so interesting if that was real. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, you know, one thing I noticed, um, a, a book of mine coming out, not that we're tooting that, but it's it's on cults and the doomsday cults. Quite a few of the, the, the leaders of these doomsday cults um, are conspiracy theorists and and believe in a lot of pretty wild conspiracies. Um, so, so there's a really good reason for that, right? I mean, if your beliefs aren't taking off, if your beliefs are confined to a small group that's largely considered crazy by everyone else, how are you going to explain that? I mean, the best way to do it is with a conspiracy. It's, oh, you know, the truth, you know, we're right, but the truth is being hidden, um, you know, by these powerful forces from everyone else. Um, everyone else needs to wake up to our truth because they've been brainwashed by the powers to be. Um, our group isn't growing because there's powerful forces working against us in secret. Um, I, I mean, a great example of this is like the, the Lyndon LaRouche cult that's been around for decades. I mean, if you talk to these people in any major city where they're, you know, protesting or something, um, it's that sort of stuff. It's like, yeah, we're right about everything, but but the truth's being hidden. So. Yeah, well, how do you win? You can't, so I, I once entered into a conversation with these LaRouge people, and it just took me down a rabbit hole, and nothing they were saying really made sense. And um, So I just exited the conversation. I, you know, I'm not going to – I don't encourage people to spend their life trying to convince somebody who's just not going to be convinced. And so you just, you know, if they're going to leave you alone, you leave them alone, you go on with your day. I mean, I, I, you can't. You can only spend so many calories being concerned about what other people think. So, so do you ever feel really threatened by anybody? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Everyone's you know, out to Al. Everyone's out to get me. Yes. <laughs> oh no. That's what I it's thought. It's a big conspiracy. <laughs> it's a big. Uh, you're there, nobody's real, just you, right? <laughs> so. I thought that when I was 11. <laughs> so <laughs> So who's out to get you? I, mean, I did coast to coast. Got oh. a bit weird. Yeah. yeah, so so I because we're coast to coast records so late at night. Um and I'm on the East Coast, so I was recording from 11 p.m. to like 3 or 4 a.m. or something like that. And this was going out live and I wound up getting a lot of really weird <laughs> emails from people. Um, I mean, some of them were just sort of, you know, disturbing. Like one woman was emailing me, like, I'm trapped in my bathroom and Madonna and Michelle Obama are keeping me locked here because I wrote all their songs and they, they won't let me have the copyright. Um, and, and it went from that to, like, other people sort of emailing me and, like, you know, you're wrong, you're part of the deep state, and you're trying to keep good people down, and I'm going to get you, and this and that. And so that, you know, you combine that with being awake at 3 in the morning, you know, with too many jolt colas, and, you know, it'll freak you out a little bit. That was the first time. So I even, I, I try not to do the late-night shows anymore. Um, oh, yeah. Coast to Coast is, is primarily that. I mean, it is yeah. pretty... Pretty wing nut um, all the way, and uh, but it wasn't. I was in London maybe two summers ago, and uh, when QAnon started getting a lot of major media attention, I was in all. You know, I think half the stories were quoting me, and uh, the Q people started to see it, and they started to to sort of poke me a little bit on Twitter. And one person put together a, a collage of pictures. They had gone through my Twitter feed and found pictures I had posted. And they put it together into a collage to make the case that I was a, you know, a baby-eating Satanist. <laughs> and it was sort of funny because I looked at it and I said, wow, I sort of do look like a baby-eating Satanist, you know. <laughs> because they had, a, they had a picture of me wearing red socks. And then they had a picture I had taken in Chinatown of ducks hanging in a window, you know, cooked Peking duck, and then a picture I had taken in an old English pub, and then I had this funny picture of me wearing like a horse mask for Halloween or something, <laughs> and they put it together, 
you know, and if you ignore every other picture on Twitter that I post to myself that makes me look like completely normal, um, if you just pick out a few, you know, you can convince somebody like, oh my God, this guy is some sort of weirdo, when in fact you're just sort of really selectively picking evidence and then sort of trying to bootstrap it to, to, to a narrative. Um, and that kind of freaked me out, that you would have people that would expend that kind of energy um, to sort of, you know, say really, really awful things about me. Um, and and, and it, it got bothersome. So yeah. I, I'm a fairly open person, but at that point I, I started getting a little bit more concerned. Yeah, yeah. Because then all your nudes get out and all of that stuff, right? Oh. <laughs> Oh. Now, now, as far as um, is this an American problem or is this a problem in the world, and how do they compare? So it's a world problem, um, but it's it's tough to compare in different places, right? So if you think that the government here killed JFK, you're engaging in conspiracy theory, right? Yeah. But if you are a North Korean and you think that the government is assassinating, you know, people. You're probably right. <laughs> so, so it's 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 there is some serious context there, right? So if you believe the official story in the U.S., you're probably going to be right more often than not. Even though sometimes the official stories will be wrong and absolutely need to be challenged, right? No, no system's perfect. But if you believe the official story in you know a place like North Korea or Cuba um, or something like that. Um, where the authorities can't necessarily be trusted, then you know you're going to be wrong more often than not. You're better off believing in the conspiracy theories. Um, so, so there is there is a major contextual problem there, and that makes it really difficult to compare from place to place, right? So, but so many people say, oh, the U.S. is you know a bunch of conspiracy theorists compared to other countries. The answer is no. Mm. Um, when you poll across contexts, you will find that conspiracy theories are alive and well in a lot of countries. I mean, more so in some than others, but the U.S. is not exceptional in the score. Um, I mean, there are places where anti-Semitism, you know, which is often conspiracy theory uh, related, is, is alive and well in other countries more than it is here. Alien beliefs, we found, are, you know, more popular in Argentina than they are in the U.S. And I always thought that was just a U.S. thing, but Argentinians dig their aliens, too. Um, <laughs> and there are other theories that, that will pop up. Like, f the French are far more um, likely to believe that we faked the moon landing than we are, right? Um, and part of that is probably context-dependent. This The moon landing, Americans did it. It's a point of pride for us. We're not going to think that we faked it. But the French are like, screw the Americans. We think they're a bunch of phonies. They they fake the moon landing. <laughs> well, they like Jerry Lewis too. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, wow. Uh, so wow. I don't know. So you're gonna. It's pretty much the same no matter where you go. You can't get away from conspiracy theory by moving to um, England or Australia. Yeah, so England is pretty much on par with us. I'm going to guess that Australia is too. I haven't done any any polling there myself, but I have seen some other other polls. Sweden seems to be the least amount that I found. Um, it's not to say it's non-existent, but if you want to get away from from it all, go take a vacation in Sweden. <laughs> How are these Scandinavians so much more civilized than the rest of us? And I'm, yeah, I'm starting to wonder what's going on there. Um, I don't know if that's the case. I think they, they, you know, they have some things that they do much better than than we do in the U.S. Um, but they they aren't immune to um, conspiracy driven politics in some of those countries. I mean, it's it's there too, and it's bubbling up, um, particularly around uh, things like immigration. Where yeah. Oh, they, yeah. oh yeah, the government's trying to get rid of our culture and trying to bring in all these. Uh, Cheaper, cheaper minority workers. Um, I have family in the Netherlands right now, and it's a big problem there. Yeah, so we, we would like to think, oh, only in the U.S. are people this crude that they would think such. A, but no, you'll find it all over the place. Fifty percent, almost, of the French um, buy into uh, the white replacement theory: the government and uh, 
corporations are trying to get rid of white Europeans in favor of cheaper brown workers. And that theory has been led to quite a bit of violence so far. I mean, you had the New Zealand shooting that was based largely on it. You had a shooting in Texas that was based on it. Um, but just imagine when something like that becomes popular. You know, you're going to have someone out there who thinks they're trying to get rid of me and people like me and get rid of my culture and they're trying to, you know, replace me. Someone's going to get violent on it. So that's that's one of the things. If you say, what, what do you think is dangerous? I mean, clearly, in recent years, those sorts of immigrant conspiracy theories are very dangerous because people will take violence against um, relatively unprotected groups. Um with deadly consequences. Now, you know, um, we've had people on before, and one recently, remember when we had um, Pellegrino on and that, and talking about uh, the uh, anti-nuclear group or the group that thought that, uh, you know, the bombings never happened uh, in Japan. Um, how, do you, how, can you, how can we address such things? I, I'm just... Things like that seem, you know, just like the the no um, people that said the Holocaust didn't happen, that try to revise history. It, it's going to take more than a conversation or a tweet, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So um, it, it, some of these beliefs, if people r really um, buy into them, and that's part of their worldview, I mean, good luck trying to change that, right? So I, I give a thought exercise to people. I mean, if you think you're going to change people's beliefs about something, I mean, put a Jew and a Catholic together in a room. Ten minutes later, are we going to come out with two Jews or two Catholics? Are they going to compromise on something? And, you know, Jesus was the Son of God on Tuesday, but not the other couple of days. I mean, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Right? If you put an atheist in a room with a Catholic, are they going to, you know, divide up the the Ten Commandments, and just pick the five they can both agree on. <laughs> it's, it, you know, people aren't going to let things go just because you have a conversation with them um, or just because you, you scream at them that they're wrong. Um, it's going to take a lot, a lot, a lot more than that. Um, but it can happen. I mean, we have stories of people who are, you know, white supremacists who sort of leave the movement and, you know, figure out that their beliefs that they were holding before were wrong. Um, we've had people deconvert out of cults and things like that. Um, but, but to do it on a mass level, you know, where, you know, I don't know what to say to a person who thinks that the planes that flew into the Twin Towers were holograms. Like, what am I going to say to that person that's going to change their mind? I mean, my guess is they're pretty invested at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... um a little beyond, you know. I mean, yeah. I can engage with them, but only so far, because I got a feeling that 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 at that point, um, if they've adopted that belief, uh, I don't think there's much there for me to argue with. I don't think they're they're dealing with the same sort of epistemology that I have. They're not they're not going to come to 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 a belief or to change a belief in the same sort of way that I, I would present evidence or argue with them. I just don't think it, 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 it's going to happen. I wonder if the Jew and Catholic would come out married. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, that happens. Sometimes. <laughs> and which religion would they take? <laughs> oh, boy. Endless, endless. Um, well, um, we look forward to your book, and, and of course it's on pre-order now. It will be out on the 15th. Um, I, you know, Joe, any last words? Uh, be nice to each other. You know, we're, we're all going to bump into people that we disagree with about a whole lot of different things. And just like politics and religion, conspiracy theories are just another one of those things. So... Um, we got to figure out how to live with each other and learn from each other and, and get along. Yeah, Alan. Yeah, yeah Al. <laughs> Blame it on me. Blame it on me. I, I, I was just going to say, now, is, do you think there's some sort of component to religion and politics 
and conspiracy that work together? Yeah, in the sense that they are all explanations of how the world works. Mm -hmm. And people don't want to negotiate on those. Right, and and part of the reason for that is is that it's it's sort of socialized into us. It's ingrained when we're young, right? It's not like people turn thirty and then like, oh, I'm going to go find a religion and find the one with the most evidence for it. I mean, most people are in a religion because they're brought up into it, so it's very hard to leave it behind because you were taught it from a very young age and it seems very real to you. Same thing with our politics. And same thing with our, our view of, of conspiracy theories. So th these are stemming from core parts of our personality that we were brought up with, and it's difficult to convert out of. So. Hmm. I see the Illuminati is making a, a big comeback, too. It's about time. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Like, well, everything's going down down the tubes in politics, so if only we had a group that can really run things right. You know, bring back the Illuminati. <laughs> when in doubt. So, Joe, um, any, any, anything else? Now, who's, who's your favorite, just, just before we go, who, who, is, who is your favorite people to talk to uh, in the conspiracy world? Oh, like in terms of conspiracy theorists, or, or yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I get a lot of emails, so I I, I enjoy it to the point um, where somebody has something new and interesting to say. Um, so, but but if it, you know the the emails that are just accusing me of being a part of it, that's sort of blasé at this point. Yeah. But if you've got a new theory about how the moon is flat and has an alien lizard base on it, then I'm all ears for that. So, <laughs> Well, guys, you can find Joe on the web as well. You've got a website, joeusinski.com, right? Yeah, J-O-E-U-S-C-I-N-S-K-I.com. And uh, the book is on Amazon, available for order now. And we'll post this on the House of Mystery website so all listeners can... Find you and please send, send <laughs> or <all>. not. <laughs> yes, and 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 we're more than willing to give you a home address, phone number, everything you need. Uh, we'll even pay for a ticket there. <laughs> well, thanks, Joe. All right, thank you, Al. You've been listening to the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www houseofmystery.com Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.